Hi, this is Mark Birch with a quick revision of John Donne's selected poems. So today I'm going to be taking a look at The Relic, um, which should be seen, I suppose, as a sister poem to The Funeral, uh, given that both of them refer to a relic and a wreath of hair around the arm. Both of them, we need to appreciate the context of uh, the Catholic concepts versus the context of a Protestant society in which it's uh, written. So relics are the body parts or belongings of saints, and veneration of relics was a key aspect of Catholicism. But we also need to appreciate that the 39 Articles of the Church of England rejected the worship of relics as repugnant to the word of God. So um, let's have a look at uh, the poem itself first of all. When my grave is broke up again, some second guest to entertain, for graves have learned that woman had to be to more than one a bed, and he that digs it spies a bracelet of bright hair about the bone. Will he not let us alone and think that there a loving couple lies who thought that this device might be some way to make their souls at the last busy day meet at this grave and make a little stay? If this fall in a time or land where misdevotion doth command, then he that digs us up will bring us to the bishop and the king to make us relics. Then thou shalt be a Mary Magdalene and I uh, something else thereby. All women shall adore us, and some men, and since at such time miracles are sought, I would have that age by this paper taught what miracles we harmless lovers wrought. First, we loved well and faithfully, yet knew not what we loved, nor why. Difference of sex no more we knew than our guardian angels do. Coming and going we perchance might kiss, but not between those meals. Our hands ne'er touch the seals, which nature injured by late law sets free these miracles we did but now alas all measure and all language i should pass should i tell what a miracle she was so already suggested that there is a parallel to the funeral but there are also similarities to the canonization in that the lovers become objects of religious worship and obviously we've got this image of the band of hair that's so reminiscent of the funeral First of all, um, we should recognise that it was common during the Elizabethan period to reuse graves, uh, breaking an old one open in order to house a new body. We have that in uh, Hamlet in Act 5, Scene 1, the graveyard scene, where uh, Hamlet uh, starts addressing the skeleton of Yorick. But Dum seems to be approaching the subject humorously, describing the new body as a guest and extending the concept of the poetic voice's dead body, hosting this guest through the verb entertain. It's noteworthy that a poem with a title associated with the Catholic faith should begin in a mocking tone. Uh, this may be appropriate given Dunn's apostasy. He was raised with a Catholic sensibility, but his conversion to the Anglican religion would demand a scepticism with regard to Catholic beliefs and practices. It's the same kind of mocking tone that we have in the juxtaposition of the title of the canonization with the blasphemous colloquial phrase that's used uh, immediately afterwards. The parenthesis offers a conspiratorial comment that complements the mocking tone. Dunn personifies graves, uh, presenting them as having learned that women prefer to have more than one in a bed. And that phrase, womanhead, also acts as a pun on maidenhead or virginity, emphasising the sexual nature of the criticism of women. The love token of a bracelet of the lover's hair is spotted by this hypothetical grave digger. The verb spies suggests immediately the value of the object identified. The intensity of visual attention is appropriate for the relic referred to. Uh, the adjective bright for the hair may refer to the blonde nature of the lover's hair, but it also conveys a sense of the hair being precious, shining like a precious metal. It represents a vitality that's in sharp contrast to the bone that it surrounds. The alliteration of the plosive B in bracelet of bright hair about the bone serves to make the bracelet stand out phonologically as well as visually. The alliteration also unifies those words in the same way that the bracelet symbolises the union of the lovers. And sexual imagery may be suggested through the male bone penetrating this circle of femininity. 
Dunn wonders whether the gravedigger will leave them alone when he recognises that the grave already contains a, a loving couple, this metaphorical loving couple of the male skeleton and the female band of hair. And he hopes that the gravedigger will recognise that the relic, this device, might be a means for the two lovers to meet again at the grave on the Day of Judgment, that late busy day. Dunn introduces a note of uncertainty from the use of the verb to think. There's no certainty that the souls will be reunited on the Day of Judgment, uh, particularly given the hectic nature of such a day, as presented in Dunn's Holy Sonnet 7. However, the hope that they may meet makes this possibility all the more moving. Given it was believed that the Day of Judgment involved the reunification of body and soul, the idea of part of the woman's body being with the poetic voice provides hope for the union of their souls, if only for a little stay. The structural positioning of the phrase before the stanza break allows the reader to pause, witnessing a little stay of their own and perhaps making the hope of something more tangible. Dunn imagines a time or place when the grave is dug up. He imagines it a place or time of misdevotion or devotion to the wrong things, in this case the worship of relics, so it's a Catholic context. The bones and bracelets of hair are imagined as being taken by the grave digger to the bishop and the king, those being the authorities with the power to verify their status as relics worthy of veneration. And while the reference to the bishop is clearly an attempt to satirise the uh, Catholic faith, the king's capacity to command religious observance in the Anglican faith is also satirised. It appears that all faiths would recognise the spiritual significance of the love that's represented here. The earthly powers of church and state are, are mocked and represented as less significant than the lovers. The pronoun us precedes the reference to the bishop and the king and is repeated, conferring additional significance on the lovers. The woman's addressed directly for the first time when the poetic voice identifies her as being regarded as a Mary Magdalene by those who find her relic. And Mary Magdalene's often depicted as having long hair, perhaps as she's often identified with the prostitute who dries Christ's feet with her hair in John 12:3. And that long hair creates a clear link with the relic itself, given that it's a band of bright hair. And the association with a prostitute who was also a follower of Jesus allows Dunn to allude to a sexual relationship whilst retaining that sense of a, a saintly identification. Mary Magdalene's also represented as the first person to encounter Christ after his resurrection at the tomb. So Magdalene's association with death and devotion that persists after death is particularly apt given the focus of this poem. The something else that the poetic voice believes that he will be identified with seems intentionally ambiguous. Given the specific reference to Mary Magdalene and her association with Christ, the implication is that the poetic voice is identified with Christ himself. That ambiguous something else avoids explicit blasphemy on Dunn's part, allowing him to implicitly identify himself with the most revered figure in Christianity. But it might also complement the sense of mocking the bishop and the king, who would identify him with such a figure. A misogynistic stereotype of the superstitious character of women is exploited in this next section. They're the ones who are most prone to misdevotion, as conveyed through the antithetical parallelism of all women, some men. More positively, it could be interpreted in such a way that they could be represented as more romantic. And this is why they shall adore us. They're more romantic and only some men are. And this Catholic conception of relics would demand an associated miracle in order to confirm the veracity of the relic. Hence, miracles are sought. Uh, this is what the bishop and the king would be looking for. Dunn introduces the poem itself in a kind of proto-postmodernist form as evidence of the miracles that the lovers perform. He's referring to this poem itself. The poem acts as another relic that may testify to the true value and power of the lovers. They may not be Mary Magdalene or Christ, but their miracles are no less astonishing. The lovers' miracles are explored in the third stanza. The first is that they loved well and faithfully. 
Their love appears to be based on a faith in each other rather than a knowledge. They don't know what we loved nor why. And that echoes the claim in A Valediction Forbidding Morning that their love is so refined that they know not what it is. Secondly, they don't recognise difference of sex. Despite the sexual allusions earlier in the poem, the poetic voice reveals that love is actually neoplatonic. The reference to guardian angels alludes to the Elizabethan belief that each individual had their own guardian angel and that angels didn't possess sexual characteristics, given that they had no bodies. Um, if you refer to Aaron Angels, the Dunn explores this in some depth. The next miracle is that they would kiss at coming and going, but at no other time. The kiss of salutation or valediction was platonic and implies no sexual attraction whatsoever. To describe those innocent kisses as meals suggests that they provide nourishment despite being chaste. And the final miracle appears to be that nothing sexual has occurred. Uh, the semantic field of law is employed in seals, uh, such as the wax seals on official documents, injured and, of course, the word law itself. This may allude to the law of God. So, for example, in 1 Corinthians 7, it's good for a man not to touch a woman, uh, the argument against fornication. Dunn appears to be citing Ovid, who in his Metamorphoses refers to the law that restricts the things that nature setteth free. If we have a look at that line in uh, the relic, which nature injured by late law sets free, you can hear the parallel. Uh, basically, the idea is that the natural inclinations towards, towards sex are injured or limited by adherence to the law. The poetic voice claims that the lovers did not give in to free desires of nature that overcome the effects of this law. Dunn also used seals as a colloquial term for sexual organs, once again praising the restraint of the lovers. He states that the miracles mentioned are insignificant in comparison to the most profound miracle, the woman herself. The woman's difference and special character is evident in the change in pronouns. The poetic voice's previous use of the second person thou and the plural pronouns us, we and our becomes the third person she. So she is separate. She is elevated. The woman's described as beyond measure. She's so miraculous that language cannot represent her. The poetic voice's inability to express the miraculous nature of the woman is, of course, very flattering. Alternatively, however, Dunn could be suggesting that the woman shouldn't be defined by language, as stated in a valediction forbidding morning, to a profanation of our joys to tell the laity our love. This sentiment seems appropriate to the context of misdevotion and a veneration of the lovers. So let's take a look at the uh, structure of the poem. Um, in terms of the stanzas, we've got uh, three 11 line stanzas, which could, through their regularity, convey the persistence of love. The meter, we've got iambic tetrameter, iambic trimeter, iambic pentameter. And so we've got frequent changes that are taking place that could represent the poetic voice's frequent turns of argument within the poem. The rhyme scheme, A, A, B, B, C, D, D, C, E, E, E. And so that's a, a really regular rhyme scheme. It's very clear, which could potentially represent, again, the continuity of love, complementing the uh, stanza lengths and form its elegaic. Uh, the notion of death is used as a context for the theme of love's significance over time, beyond the physical death of the body. Okay, thanks ever so much folks, take care, bye.